This is Lee Forster, SES Honcho. I'm here to give you a preview overview of the standard combat series game Day of Days coming out summer 2015. Uh, Day of Days is a big four map study of the first 10 days of the invasion of Normandy. It's got four maps and eight counter sheets, so it's definitely a monster, but uh, I like to think of it as a very playable monster. So like all the standard combat series games, there are special rules to bring out the flavor of this particular situation, but the focus is on playability and on narrative and not on rules lawyering. And uh, yes, those of you who know me understand I'm a disciple of Dean Essig. Keep it simple whenever you can. Day of Days focuses, on, like I said, on the first 10 days of Normandy before things got bogged down into a stalemate, which lasted several weeks. Uh, this was a period where the Allies really could have made significant gains before the Germans reinforced the area, and so it's still something of a mobile period. Uh, the goal isn't for that, it's not a game where the Allies slog through the Bocage for several weeks and then achieve their breakout of Cobra. It's really a focus, a study on just the first part, the first week and a half, to see if the Allies can achieve or come close to achieving their initial D-Day objectives. So it's also not focused on the landings themselves. They're really a minor part of this game. The focus is really on getting your forces arrayed as the Allies to achieve a breakthrough and on the Germans trying with whatever means you can to prevent that. So there is some mobility here, but this is not at all like the, the SES games in the North Africa, where there's a lot of mo mobility or something having to do with the Russian steppes in the OCS. Uh, tactics are important here, but there really is a focus on committing your forces at the right place at the right time. And as you play this game, you'll see what I'm talking about with that. Now, in terms of the map, what I like about this is it really divides into four separate biomes, if I can use that word. There's four sort of areas of the map that play very differently. So, now, hopefully you'll be playing this in teams, so each of you can have your own biome. But if you're playing this yourself, you're going to have to adapt your tactics to the specific areas. Now, the first area we'll look at, I'm going to scroll over on this map, is uh, here up in the landing at Utah, and that's with all of this flooded area. And you'll see sort of swamp, marsh, and flooded area through here. This really slows down mechanized units completely, and it really prevents a lot of attacks. Now, as the, the Allies are trying to cross the river over here, they're going to find that they're halved when they're in this material, in this train, and trying to attack across the rivers, which halves you again, it's going to be very difficult to make progress things. Things really slow down in that area. So the flooded area and the swamp is sort of one biome where you're going to have to check the movement costs, really look at your units to make sure you're not trying to get mechanized or motorized troops in there because they can't move through the stuff for the most part. Now, the, the most of the map you'll see is this terrain here and also in the area between around Omaha and a large part of the British sector. This terrain here, the, the majority of the map, is light bocage. Light bocage costs two movement points for non-foot, so it slows things down a bit. But most importantly, uh, units cannot conduct exploitation movement in any hex that contains light or heavy bocage, whether there's a road or not. This is going to be a real change if you're used to having mechanized formations achieve a breakthrough and then punch through. This is not going to happen in the Bocage. So armor still has a role, but because it has to stay close to the roads, it can't really move too much and there's no exploitation movement, it simply becomes a stronger force to support the infantry in their advances. So it's going to be much more of a grind and you're going to have to pay attention a great deal to tactics and still using armor's limited advance after combat abilities, which are not negated in Bocage. So if you get a breakthrough, you can advance a few hexes. But you're going to find that your usual surrounded pound approach to standard combat series games is not going to work the same way in the light Bocage. So that's very important. The third biome is the open biome. <laughs> I'm calling it biome. That's not really in the rules or anything. That's this terrain here in the British sector around Ken. It's open terrain. This is basic standard combat series stuff. Tanks have all their advantages, and you're going to find with the 21st Panzer and whatever else the Germans throw in this area, there is the potential for a large amount of mobile hacking and slashing out in this area. The Commonwealth is going to have to be very careful that they don't get careless because the Germans can mount a credible counterattack if you give them the opportunity in this area. The fourth biome, which will effectively, which will affect the Americans most of all, is the heavy bocage. And this is if uh, once they make some progress off the beaches. Here I'm showing you the Omaha um, sector. And if they advance down to here, hopefully they'll get there at some point if you're the odd player. You run into this heavy bocage. Heavy bocage costs two for infantry 
which means that you can't really advance between zones of control because it's two for the hex and two for zone of control, you're sort of stuck. So you'll find you can't infiltrate very well in this stuff. Mechanized pay five. It's two favorable combat shifts to the defender and defense against artillery. So this stuff is nasty. It's going to be a grind, and you'll find, too, as you play, because of some of the idiosyncrasies of the, se of the sequence of play, that you'll need to develop an entirely different set of tactical tools to deal with the heavy bocage. That's one thing I love about this game, is you can't just pick one approach, one tactic, one way of handling your units and apply it everywhere. You have to really modify your tactics depending on which area of the map you're operating, which biome, as I called it there. So that's one of the things about this uh, game that I really like. Uh, let's take a look at the sequence of play. I'll call this up here. Uh, you'll notice that um, there are you know, the usual weather reinforcements. Of course, we have some airdrops and landings at the beginning. Road March exists in this game, just like in um, it, uh, uh, INS, It Never Snows, and uh, the best known game. So that'll be here. Uh, one limit of the Road March is you cannot cross the borders between the four maps using Road March. So that will slow down lateral movement quite a bit. The most important thing here is that uh, we have disorganized results too. The barrage phase happens during the ally turn only. There is no barrage phase in the German, nor is it a common phase that happens uh, between turns of some such thing. What does this mean? This means that the allied player can move and barrage with units that just move. Now, you can't do this and it never snows. There you have to plan your barrages a turn before because you have to move units adjacent to the enemy in order to barrage them. You move them up and then at the beginning of the turn you have the barrage phase. That's as I recall it. In this game, the allied player can move up and then barrage with uh, spotting with the units he just moved. So this gives the allied player a lot of flexibility in using its artillery assets to disorganize German defenders and try to achieve a local breakthrough. However, the German barrage phase comes right after the allied barrage phase, which means the Germans can defend themselves with barrages before the allies get to attack. So if the German has properly amassed artillery support behind vulnerable points in the line, uh, it's going to be dis DG stacks fighting each other. Then there's exploitation. Now, what this means, too, of course, is that the Germans don't have this flexibility of marching up to our units and then barraging them before combat. This represents what happened in the campaign pretty well, though, because the Germans tended not to use preliminary bombardments during this period, maintaining the element of surprise, preferably. They figured they did better if they just hit places where the Allies weren't expecting them. And you'll find that this is great for counterattacks. Allies march up. Germans barrage and DG them. In their turn, then, they commit forces to counterattack these forces, which are DG'd. And if they've kept their, their panzers or panzer units in the rear, this can really give them a little counterpunch if the Allied is not careful. So that's something about the sequence of play. It's asymmetrical. Uh, supply. Really important in this game. Uh, supply is a typical uh, standard combat series of rules for supply. How do you trace supply? You have to trace supply to a, usually for the allies, a beachhead, connect to a road, and then units can trace a hex, uh, trace a path five hexes to a road, and that road then goes back to the supply source. Why is that important? There are a, a great number of choke points in this game. So the allied players or player will want to check the road net very carefully and find out how they can advance. And so we look at, at uh, Bayeux here, you see a lot of roads coming into it, and there aren't a whole lot of lateral roads going out here. So this target for the Commonwealth is really, really important because it, uh, it opens up the entire supply network to let them advance. Otherwise, they're gonna be stuck maybe with a route going down this way or that way through this heavy terrain. And so I'll leave this as an exercise to you to study the roadmaps very well because these will dictate to a large extent the actual allied avenues of approach. And if you do that and were to do a little research and look up to see what the allies were actually doing during this period, you will find that the allied goals fit almost perfectly with the road net here. So allies had the allied players or well, the allied forces had supply in mind when they were doing this. If we look at the initial invasion, you will find that there are these units, the uh, VN, a WN Waffennesta, and these are, you know, the pillboxes and forces and such. Uh, they don't tend to last too long. First day, most of them are pretty much gone, but it's kind of fun to take them out. Uh, they have barrage strengths for the most part and defensive strength. They always have a zone of control, so they can't be DG. This is pretty important. Uh, they have two steps. And they must be taken as the first step losses when they suffer actual combat casualties. So they will be tough, but a little brittle. But they will really plug up the Allied advance until the Allied player takes those out. 
Now, one more, I'm not going to cover all the special rules here, but one of the things that uh, you'll need to get used to with this game as well are activations. That is, each side can activate only a certain number of its uh, larger formations, usually divisions, sometimes regiments or brigades. Each turn, this represents basic operational tempo, being able to plan to keep up supplies for the Allies. Uh, the Germans had a lot of problems dealing with Allied air, uh, air superiority, messing up, uh, bringing up reinforcements, messing up their planning and such. So it's not the normal SES game where you move everything and attack with everything. You have to choose which formations are activated each turn. A formation that's activated behaves just, just as normal units in, in SES games. If they're not activated, then they cannot attack and they cannot move from one enemy zone of control to another, so you can't use them to infiltrate that way. They also cannot spot for barrages. So what players will find is that there will be quiet sectors on the front that develop because uh, it, maybe you don't have much there and you decide it's not worth committing your precious activation points to that area when there's not much of a chance of doing anything. This cuts down on the number of gratuitous barrages too from the German player. You can't just fire all your mortars every turn with no cost. And it also fortunately saves us from tracking ammo. So you don't have to track ammo in this game. That's handled also through this activation system. And if you look here at this uh, vassal module here are the counters for all the units you can activate it's one per unit except the uh, large armor formations for the germans cost two so they have to decide whether they're going to do that or not uh, the germ the allied player determines which ones are activated and then the german so the the german player can wait to see where the allied player is putting the resources where they're going to be trying to do something and then activate um, formations in that area in order to counteract it german player will have to think a little bit here because Activation happens at the beginning of the turn, the Allies move, and then the Germans. So if the Germans are planning a counterattack, they have to sort of think what could the Allied players be doing, where could they be moving forces, because they don't get to do it right at the beginning of their turn. They have to plan before the Allies move uh, which units are going to be activated. So that's uh, one of the features of this game, too. There are um, formations that are called non-banded, and they don't have and affiliation they're much more limited in their abilities to operate if you're non-banded you can't move during exploitation and to attack you have to be working with or participating in an attack with an activated formation so what this avoids is what kind of can happen in some SES games. You have what were actually support armor tanks designed to support infantry banded together into little mini uh, panzer corps that go marching around, uh, leaving a swath of destruction in their wake. In this game, the support units have to be support units. They have to stay with activated formations, and they can't work with mechanized formations. So you can't double the size of a, an allied armor division by throwing all the tank assets from your various infantry formations there. It just doesn't work. So I left out uh, a lot of other rules. Uh, you can see here there are victory points for the train. Each map is calibrated around what are roughly 10 victory points. Uh, that is accepting things like Ken, which you can see here is a gold mine. If you can get there, uh, it's possible. It's happened, but it's tough. Uh, also, uh, saint Lo over here uh, for the Americans, if you can get there, that's worth quite a few points. But generally, uh, the, German, the Allies excuse me, will not achieve those goals. You can try, and it happens, but uh, usually not. And then progress at the end of these 10 days, 22 turns, is measured according to how many of these you take. Each map can be played. There are a lot of scenarios. There are a lot of one-map scenarios. At least the two American beaches are one-maps. And then the Commonwealth is two. Uh, and you can see sort of how far you get. They're calibrated according to actual Allied progress at that point. Five points is about a tie. That's sort of where the Allies got. The Allies are going to have to be doing better overall to achieve a victory. And the Germans, likewise, will have to squash the Allies a little bit more than they did in order to achieve a victory. So I'm going to do a, a replay at some other point. Uh, let's just do a quick survey of each map, and you can kind of see the initial positions. That's a lot of counters stacked up. This is before uh, the first turn. And the first three turns are really the first half day. The, the invasion is handled in a couple of small impulses of small mini turns. You can see here that uh, the Allied air forces are getting ready to drop. They will scatter according to the same sort of rules as, as it never snows. Yet some of them are so dispersed that they won't actually appear for a day or two. So a lot of these units you see here will not actually appear on the map for a while. And that gives the Germans some time to respond and maybe even mount a, uh, an attack to try to take this area here. Although the Allies tend to actually do better taking these bridges than they did historically. 
Uh, here are the units invading. Um, you can look up the invasion rules are fairly straightforward. You just roll randomly to see what beach you land on. Nothing too special. Uh, you can overstack on beaches, and that gives positive modifiers to barrages. So the German player will want to inflict as much damage with the artillery as they can before the Allies inevitably escape. Over here at Omaha, it's a little tougher. I would say a lot tougher. You can see the defenses are much more concentrated. There's terrain here that can stop them quite nicely. So uh, I've seen in all the playing, sometimes the Allies, uh, the Americans break out pretty quickly. Sometimes they get stuffed the first day and really only get out at the beginning of the second day. It just depends on the dice um, and it depends on, on um, tactical play on the Allied part. However, there's just not a lot of a backstop here for the Germans. So this is a very, very delicate area. And I will just give one warning to the German player. Don't get too eager about holding your ground. You really got to be smart about pulling out when you need to. All these bridges and rivers will channel allied attacks. And don't, if you try to hold this line too long as a German and you get overwhelmed, there is nothing behind. <laughs> There's no stopping that American. So you have to be really smart. And it's really several turns before massive reinforcement formations start coming in. Over here in the Commonwealth, it's a lot like anyone who's, uh, who's read about the battle. You'll find that the Commonwealth forces are more than a match for the defenders. They will uh, uh, advance quite quickly. And so as the German player, you're going to want to know, where do I want to draw the line? Well, it's not in sand. I guess you're drawing the line in the bocage. What's the furthest point forward you can make a credible defense without suffering undue casualties because the Commonwealth has a greater force potential at that point. There are some pretty big German formations that are showing up, but they don't show up for a couple of days. So you have to, as, as the Germans think, how much space do I want to give up in order to preserve my forces? Now, uh, over here in this spot, uh, uh, the Allies will need to think how aggressive they want to be with their airborne. Do they want to push out in this area? I will say that there's an entire 21st Panzer Division just chomping at the bits to get in there and tear them up if you let them. So the, the, the Commonwealth player here is going to have to think hard about how much they want to try to achieve with the airborne. You are definitely wanting to take these bridge, this bridge or these bridges here as soon as possible to give yourself the flexibility of getting some real troops over here with some armor and especially artillery. The uh, para airborne troops do not have much artillery, so you, uh, you're going to want to get some over there to support them as soon as you can. And then the German player will want to know how tough do they want to defend. Do they want to try to hold the line up over here? Do they want to yield a little bit more than they did historically? You know, it's even possible to fall back almost to the city and just make it a meat grinder. It's really hard to take this stuff. So but I, I'll leave that up to you uh, players to, to figure out how you're going to handle that. So in sum, it's a big game. It splits nicely into these sectors. If you go back to Utah, I think there is a scenario for various stages of the Utah campaign. And it actually is a great game all on its own. Can you uh, take the bridges and get off the map with enough stuff? The Germans do get a credible amount of forces here to stop the Allies. And the battle around uh, Cahantana is going to be ugly. And this can really go either way. Uh, in fact, I find the Germans holding this a bit more than they did historically, usually. So this is a brutal area. You'll find as the Allies, it's really hard to attack across here. And yet the Germans just never seem to have enough troops to cover everything the way they like to. Omaha, tough here. Lots of rapid advance. The question for the Germans is, do I defend as the Germans here in the light bocage or fall back pretty quickly to the heavy bocage? It's a matter of timing. The Commonwealth is a meat grinder for both sides. The Germans have a number of very strong formations that generally commit to here. The Commonwealth is strong as well. I will give one caution the Commonwealth, husband your armor. Don't throw it away too quickly. Be very careful when you commit it because you'll find near the end of this scenario, at the end of the game, you really wish you had more than you usually have. So it's just like in the actual tactics you want to, that, that we're using at the time, you want to use your infantry to try to achieve breakthroughs or wear the Germans down. And once you've got some spots that are vulnerable, go ahead and punch through with your armor. There are some other scenarios. There's a Canadian Crucible uh, scenario taken from the TCS game where those of you who play TS can, can relive that in a very small SES scenario. And then, of course, there is the uh, Villa Bocage scenario, which is brutal, <laughs> very vicious. It this sets up with a hole in the German lines, which they left, which the Allies road marched through. And this can happen in your normal strategic campaign all the time, too. If you're tired, you've had a few too many beers, you leave one road open accidentally, you're going to find tons of Commonwealth piling through there. And yet the Germans have enough to really put a smackdown on them if they're not careful. 
That is a quick overview. I encourage you guys to pick this up while you can. Uh, I've played this game a lot, and I can honestly say that I have come nowhere close uh, to understanding all the intricacies, all the tactics, all the approaches that the SCS um, game system combined with the special rules and these great forces that Carl Fung put together. There is so much here yet to discover that I don't think I'm ever going to figure out. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing some of the initial playthroughs that you guys do and the things that you find out about this game, about the situation, and uh, how the SCS works. Good luck.